Last week, I did something for the first time that I've been wanting to do for years. I featured on a podcast. So I was lucky enough to be a guest on Paris Scobie's Live Well Bipolar podcast. I talk about all my experiences, how the bipolar and psychosis came about, and I give you advice on what I think will help you make a faster recovery. Enjoy. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Live Well Bipolar podcast. I am excited because I'm not alone in this one. I am joined with a new friend of mine who lives in Essex in London in the UK. So it's super exciting. We connected over email. He reached out to me, and now we're going to just collaborate and share our stories to help other people be able to understand what it's like to live with bipolar disorder and manage life in a way that is helpful for us and those that we love. And I am talking about Mr. Mike today. He is a mental health lived experience ambassador, YouTube creator, and successful entrepreneur. So Mike, thank you so much for coming out onto the podcast. I cannot wait to dive into your story. We were talking before we hit record. There's a lot of things in the works that I'm looking forward to. So thanks for coming out. No, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me. First podcast for me. So a little bit nervous, ah, but let's see how it goes. That is amazing. I love that. I've had so many people on this show who it's their first podcast, whether, you know, that's the thing that I think is so beautiful, whether it is your first time on a podcast or you've been on like 60, a hundred, whatever, you know, however number, I think that it's so exciting because it's going to be so much fun just to dive into what you are doing and creating. And I ended up connecting with Mike because like I said, in the beginning, he sent me an email actually through my website and he was wanting to connect to have this conversation and share his story. And then also have me share my story on his YouTube channel. So I will have all of that linked in the show notes for you guys to connect with him on his YouTube channel. And he is actually working on a book right now, which I told him before hitting record. I was like, if you need any advice, any help, because I published my book almost three years ago. And I remember the entire journey and process. So I just love anyone who is willing enough to share their lived experience in a way that Mike is doing, not only on his YouTube channel, but also in developing his book that he is working on. So before we get into all of that stuff, right? The book in the works, the YouTube channel, your path into entrepreneurship, and then also living with bipolar disorder, being hospitalized, experiencing psychosis, the good, the bad, the ugly. I want to start with you and who you are as a person. So can you start off and just Give us a little bit more background on you and your first experience with learning that you were living with bipolar. Yeah. Cole, you're good at this, isn't you? You know more <laughs> about me than I know about me. <laughs> it's, because you, it's because you filled out the form. It's so I, like we this yeah. is our first time meeting, but you give me all that info and then I just roll with it. And I told you, I was like, when we hit record, it'll be conversational. Oh, no. That's how the show is. It's like so no, low pressure. Like it's just I like, play. you, you know, you can your friends, tell you so. practice. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so my experience then to answer your question with bipolar um, goes back to 2019, so five years ago now. At the end of 2019, I basically went on a two-week stag do with some friends. It was um, it was a wedding and stag do. So I'm sorry, uh, what is a stag do? Stag do. <laughs> But is it called? I think it's called a bachelor party, isn't it? Oh, okay. Yeah. A bachelor so party. before the before the wedding, all the boys go out or go on holiday somewhere, drink a load, go a bit crazy, do some things that they probably regret. Just fresh for the <laughs> wedding a few days later. Um, so yeah, we went we went abroad. Um, back then, I was working. In the corporate world, I was a quantity surveyor, so in construction, working on numbers and figures and projections and forecasts and bits and pieces like that. Quite a high stress job. Um, and where I went away and then came back after the two weeks, I was overwhelmed with the the amount of work that I that had built up while I'd been away. Um, and I stupidly i had my emails work emails on my phone and stayed up what must have been i reckon three or four nights all the way through answering work emails trying to catch up bits and pieces like that and 
didn't realize that I was moving gradually into psychosis. Didn't feel tired, which is quite surprising after three or four days without sleep. Maybe had half an hour or so. Uh And actually felt more energetic. um, Felt like my thoughts were clearer, more concise. um, I was more confident. Yeah, others around me were noticing signs, asking questions. I was obviously acting quite erratically and I was going through psychosis. So it was at my worst point was actually the day that it was the it was the Christmas works do. But I'd left the business. So so all this had built up and I was like, right, that's it. Like I'm quitting. That's it. This is my last day at the company um and then i went out drinking again with one of my friends in a state of psychosis already which made it worse um i ended up like screaming like thinking i was um like a powerful religious figure like being jesus i felt like i was sent down by god and ended up so so it was that night stayed out didn't sleep again that night and then the following day i ended up in a and e the local hospital and yeah then i was i was sectioned for a, for a 28 day section and yeah the psychosis i think for about a week um stayed at that like really intense point and then the medication kicked in and i slowly came around slowly recovered to the point where i was like get me out of this hospital <laughs> and then uh oh, yeah wow and then I came out and it was, I think it was only three to four weeks or so. The medication I was on was changed because it just wasn't working for me. I was, my body was shaking. It was really intense. Wasn't myself. I couldn't really sleep either on that high level of medication. But when it changed, unfortunately, I relapsed again and went back in for another 28 day section. And then after that, made a slow recovery which took probably two to three years and i'd say now i've made a full recovery wow oh my if there is such thing (laughs) yeah no i i'm listening to everything you were saying and i i feel like i relate so much because with my hospitalization i felt very similar to you because i also remember coming home and they there was different medications that i was put on in the hospital versus like when I was being home. And I noticed the same things like you were saying, leading up to psychosis, being very confident and erratic and not sleeping and feeling like you just weren't tired. Like I was just going, going, going. And then also you mentioned the career you were in. So talking about, you know, the high stress job, corporate for crunching numbers with the construction company, and then deciding, you know, this is, I'm quitting, I'm leaving, I'm done. And I'm going to go out and and you mentioned drinking. And that was a lot of what I did as well. So, Mm -hmm. you know, high, high stress job situations, partying, drinking, just I'm going to distract myself, which actually ended up making it worse to the point where I was just not really present. I wasn't able to work on myself or any of my relationships or anything. So when you're mentioning this, so much of it sticks out to me because especially the hospitalization part, you say that, and when you say 28 day section, does that mean that you spent 28 days in the hospital? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, I think that's the minimum turn that you, you need to stay for when you're sectioned. So, okay. Yeah. yeah stay for the you, guys, 28 days. you guys have 28. So for me, it was the minimum for me, it was two weeks. I remember Mm. that. And then I left, but it felt like a year. I don't know if you also felt that way. Like it felt like time just because they take away your phone. You don't have anything to, to look at. So it just felt like I was there for such a long time. And I remember when you said you talked about this two to three years coming out of your hospitalization, but then you went back again, you were hospitalized again. Then you came home and you said that, you know, two to three year period of just adjusting to life. So I'd love to hear from you, your perspective. What did you experience during those two to three years? Did you have any other relapses again? What changes did you make that ended up helping you get on the path to feeling like I am now in recovery today? Yeah. So 
the th- well, focusing on sleep. I know a lot of people say on your podcast as well. Sleep is number <laughs> one for me. Um, the medication the second time when I came out as an antipsychotic called Alanzapine. I was on a high dose, which meant that all I could really do all day was sleep. And I was, I remember waking up maybe midday ish and, and getting through to one o'clock and then feeling drowsy again, la- lounging out on the sofa, feeling like I could nap again for an hour, mm-hmm. had no energy at all. So that allowed me to at least get some sleep and, and my thoughts to slow down. Um, my memory isn't the greatest as to when I first came out, but I was offered free psychology through the NHS system that we've got here. And when I first had the psychology, I remember it was just a, a telephone appointment and I was laying in bed at the time and I couldn't even get through what was maybe a half hour, 45 minute phone call without feeling like I just need to fall asleep during this. Mm. And then, so I must have had, we tested that maybe two or three times and then potentially the medication may have been reduced. I don't know, maybe 10% changed to my psychologist. And it was when I started to have a little bit more energy and have similar to this format. So it was like a team's style psychology and with the new psychologist, we just, we just got on really well. I uncovered loads of stuff from my past where I didn't realize that. So yeah, I don't, it could have been something that I was dealing with when I was between eight and 15 years old and I'd carried it all the way through till I think yeah, I was 22 at the time. So up till then that allowed me to unravel those thoughts and it was like a weight off my shoulders when I had some mm-hmm. answers to those questions. So that was great. And I had the psychology for, I'd say maybe five to six months and from the start to the end of that psychology, there was a massive change in me. I was, um, my communication with my my friends and family was better. I was talking, I was actually expressing my true feelings and being honest and open, which allowed me to build relationships as opposed to like not being upfront and open and scared that I was going to offend people. So the psychology really helped sleep as I've mentioned, was a massive one. And I I reduced the amount of times that I was going out. I was still going out at the time, but maybe as opposed to every week or sometimes twice a week, reduced that down to like once a month and really focused on my drinking and not staying out till early hours. That was, so that covers probably the first year. And then I decided to give up drinking. And I tried that for also a big point to mention is i was smoking weed before my psychosis um cannabis marijuana whatever you want to call it and decided that that's it i was quite stubborn before then i was like oh no it's good for you it allows you to be open-minded why is it legal Mm -hmm. in some states in america and amsterdam places like that so it can't be that bad and then i just let that go and that had a, a positive impact as well but I think the the main thing is, so after a year, yeah, I decided to quit drinking. I did that for a few months and then it was like a couple of drinks here and there. But now I'm completely sober and I have been since January last year. So I think it's about 550 days now. Wow. And it feels like there's just, there's no setbacks. Sleep's wow. improved. There's nothing to, to hold me back at all. So I think oh. that was, that's probably the main thing. Okay. That is, I, everything you just listed, I feel like you are just talking about my experiences because all of that stuff was exactly what I changed as well. Like you talk about sleep, you talked about therapy, you talked about connecting to work through things that you had suppressed. Like you talk about maybe from the ages of eight to 15 and carrying this with you to being able to, to communicate your feelings, how I'm thinking, what's going on. And, and then also you talk about quitting drinking, giving up weed, all of that stuff really. And then reducing the amount of times that you go out as well. So I really liked when you were saying that, cause that's something that I did as you, you say, instead of going out, you know, maybe like two times a week or whatever, I went to like once a month or I just le- like lessened it. 
And I feel like I've actually noticed the same thing because when I was at my worst, like right before my hospitalization, even after my hospitalization, I can tell you I was hospitalized at 19 from 19, even when I came home. So 19, 20, 21, 22, four more years, I spent four more years basically doing the same things again, because I was trying to, okay, let me kind of try to change this, but I fully didn't believe in myself. I didn't have the right supports around me. I didn't have the right environment. I didn't have the right mindset. So I went back to the same life doing what I was doing before until I really had that wake up moment where I was like, I need to make my sleep a priority. I need to change what I'm doing, my habits, or else I'm going to continue being frustrated and cycling in and out of these extreme feelings of deep depression and then such high states of being manic where I can't come down, I can't slow down and I'm just full of rage or all of these feelings. So everything you're saying is what is super helpful because that's why I started this podcast is to show people listening. What are the things that we can do from people who've lived it and are still living it, right? We're still living with yeah. bipolar as, and as far as we know, right? There's no cure in the world. hundred percent. We're never going to have to deal no. with it ever again. But that's what, what I love about you is you talk about this is how bad it was for me, right? Like I was going to going out drinking. I didn't feel like I could change, right? I was stuck in these habits, but this is what I did, right? I, I looked at what I could control. So talk to me about after this. So this was in 2019, right? 2019. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, late 2019, December 2019, okay. carried over to came out in Feb 2023. No, oh. 2020, 2020, sorry. Oh, 2023 wow. so last year. 2020. And then when you say, so from 2019, and then you said you spent about two to three years working on yeah. getting your life where it is now, where you have the routine, the habits. And also I think having such a discipline with yourself is huge because especially with drinking, mm -hmm. like this is such an interesting thing because I actually last year is the first time that I ever was like, I want to just cut back on drinking. And I think it's important to know that you do not need to be somebody who is an alcoholic, who has been like severely impacted by addiction to want to make a change in this area. Anyone can do it. And I think that so many people who don't know a lot about mental illness or addiction or substance use or any of this stuff, they might look at us and be like, especially if you're a woman, right? Like, oh, are you pregnant? Is that why you're not drinking? Or yeah. were you an alcoholic? And I feel like I've seen that a lot, but also it's becoming a lot more normal to have non-alcoholic beverages mm -hmm. at restaurants and no one really questions it as much. I think it's more of an internal thing. Like when we're thinking, what are people going to think of me if I don't go out and drink because, but also it's, you change your relationships, right? You make new connections and yeah. new friends who are like-minded, who are interested in what you're pursuing, right? With your passion for sharing your insights on YouTube, for working on your book, for entrepreneurship, you're around people like that instead of the people who are like, let's just go get drunk. And Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Drinking partners. I talk about this quite a lot. Um, I've spoken about on the YouTube as well, that when you first decide to quit drinking or whatever it is that you're taking, that initial first two to three times that you go out with a particular group of friends is the worst two to three times there all night. You're going to get, why have you stopped drink drinking? Like they think there's a, a problem with you. They, they think maybe that you're not going to be as fun. You're not going to be as sociable you're going to ruin their night and it's getting through those initial conversations a hundred percent. That's the hardest part. And then after that times four, five, six, seven, each time <laughs> it gets so much easier. Mm -hmm. um, you start to, you start to build a different identity around you and people see you differently. They, I think that they respect you that, okay, you actually commit to this. Um, they stop asking the questions unless it's new people that have met you. I don't know about you, but I always find that like, say you're at a party and you've got a drink in your hand and you'll, you'll have a conversation with someone that you've never met before. And they'll be like, oh yeah, should we go and get a drink at the bar? What do you want? I'll, I'll have an alcohol free beer or whatever. And they go, oh, you're not drinking. And I'm like, no, no, I haven't <laughs> drunk for like a year or so. They'll always turn around and say, oh yeah, I don't drink much either. 
while they've got a glass <laughs> of wine or that doing some shots. Okay. I don't quite understand why they do that, but it might be a thing that they're trying to relate to you or maybe they think that we see drinking as a really bad thing, but it's not. It's just a personal choice. Yes. Uh, but I've, I've found that quite a lot. And yeah, the, the longer that I've done, I think when it got to about six months, I was like, this is easy now. And I look forward to going out more than I did before because I know that I'm not going to get a hangover. You remember all the conversations. That, that's that's an amazing thing. Like you wake up the next day and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, so-and-so said this. I remember this. Right. Um, all new stories. And then at the same time, um, you're – when before when i'd have a drink i'd actually i know people drink like they say oh like it's a it's a crutch for confidence mm -hmm. i sometimes felt like after i'd have a drink when i was around certain people especially in a more professional environment that i'd have a couple and then i'd start feeling anxious that i was going to say something right. which i would regret or do something or stumble over and it's knowing that you're much less likely to do something like that you're just in completely complete control for me yeah. gives me more confidence but i don't think that's spoken about really at all um yeah yeah that, that's what i said and i think when you when you first come out of psychosis or hospitalization you initially think that's that's gonna happen to me like once or twice like what are the chance is gonna happen to me again i for me i was drinking maybe like five or six years before that and i'd know nowhere near that so you think yeah that's all that's a once in a lifetime thing it's not going to happen again then you just go back to those standard habits before but i think if you have bipolar or know someone with bipolar it's really important to remember that we are more sensitive to those sorts of things and we should take it much more seriously and if you can do everything you can to prevent it you should have nothing to worry about um so yeah that's what advice i'd give yeah i really love that because i think especially when you're saying this is I, i've seen this be such a common thing and i never thought that i would be the type of person who would just not drink as much and i feel like and i want to be clear like i am not i drink probably like a couple times a year you know now but I also know for me, it works for me to not set a hundred percent clear black and white boundary on, I can never drink alcohol ever again, because I feel like then that my brain just feels, it just feels off and weird for me. So I just go with it. You know, when I go places, I, I don't drink, but say if I go on a trip, you know, me and my husband are going to Bora Bora at the end of the, this month, next month. So we'll probably have wine or something there. But I think it's, it's just, it's what works for you. That's what I tell everyone. Mm -hmm. It's so individual. And if you are someone who's feeling, and also it's so freeing to not feel the pressure when you go places to, cause like you said, the first two or three times are hard when people are like, Oh, you're not drinking. Cause people aren't used to that. Like my friends and people who know me, they're used to the Paris who goes out to dinner and, and parties and events. And I'll always have like, you know, a drink or two. It's not like I'm always getting drunk every single time. Right. I'm not doing that, but it's just weird for people. Right. When they're used to, to knowing you this way and you're like, Oh, I'm not drinking. And then of course it comes up. Oh, are you pregnant? Is that why you're not drinking? And I'm like, no. And I then get it's that like, one a lot as well. Yeah. You get that one right all the time. So it's yeah. just like, but I think what you're saying is so powerful because it's defining what works for you, but also examining where you are right now. Do you think alcohol could potentially be causing an issue because I hate having the headaches, the hangovers, feeling mm. like shit. It just, it actually contributes to like symptoms for me of worsening for bipolar. Like I start to get in my head, be super negative, isolate. Like it just doesn't make it better for me. So I've changed my lifestyle. So that's really what I like to, to highlight on the podcast too, for you guys is it's about where you're at right now, what's working, what's not. And also being open to change, right? If, Hey, you know, maybe I want to try cutting back and see how I feel. It's not a hundred percent. You need to be like me or Mike and never drink again, or, you know, significantly change your life. It's just starting small. Right. So I'd love to ask you to, and kind of transition into something else here, um, with you sharing about entrepreneurship. So talk to us about this path into what you do today. Like, I'd love to hear, you know, what do you do today and how did you get into what you're doing and how does it, 
work alongside living with bipolar for you? Yeah. So actually when I left school, I studied web design. Um, I wanted to go to college to do graphic design and the course wasn't right for me. It was graphic communication. It, when I went to enroll, it wasn't exactly what I thought it would be. So yeah, I ended up doing an online course. I think it was only about 150 pound here. So what's that? $200 where you are. Mm-hmm. And just learned basic coding like on websites. It was very different back then, 10, 11 years ago to what it is now. Um, and started to code up websites for local businesses. And they would take, God, like it would take me two months to make a couple of pages. And it was just ridiculous. So I thought, I wow. can't really do this. Um, and I was, yeah, I think I was 16 or 17. And I thought, right, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go and work in a local coffee shop with my sister temporarily and then try and speak to the customers and look for a real job. <laughs> and I thought I'd end up in a a car sales garage or something like that, just from speaking to people. And one of the customers was one of the directors at the company where I was a quantity surveyor at. So left the coffee shop into the corporate world as a quantity surveyor. And then obviously, as I've spoken about, after the five years I was there, went into psychosis, then I quit. But always when I was working there um, in the office, I always wanted to do my own thing. And I thought, I don't like staying in the same three meters squared for the mm-hmm. for like five, five years gone. And I can't imagine myself staying here for another year or two, even if I worked up to managing director and whatever the salary would be there, I just wouldn't be fulfilled. I like the freedom. I like not knowing what's coming in next month. It could be zero. It could be 10,000. You never know. And it's the excitement of knowing that and things being in my control. So when I, uh, when I was recovering, I actually started a little hamper business, just selling some gift hampers on Etsy and have, had a, um, an Amazon FBA shop, fulfillment by Amazon, where you, you list the products on there, Amazon do all the fulfillment and take about 40%. And it went quite well. I sold all the ones that I made, but I was like, this is just this is just not me. I had um, mum and dad's dining room from the ceiling <laughs> to the floor. The whole room was full of these hampers. <laughs> and I just thought like, oh, this is just, this is not me. I'm not a hamper guy. Um, <laughs> so... Then I went into personal training and sort of found that most of the personal training job came down to doing your own forms of digital marketing. So making shorts, TikToks, Instagram reels, bits and pieces like that. And doing like some light sales work on calls like this or just through DMs and messaging people. And I turned it from personal training to an online coaching business and then felt like what I was charging had a cap to it. I couldn't charge any more than really what people were willing to pay 150 pound a month. And then I was limited to how much I could coach people found that my own coaching and giving people personal training plans and meal plans and bits and pieces like that actually turned into being a full-time therapy job. (laughs) So back and forward with my clients over WhatsApp, over Instagram, Mm -hmm. trying and I find out the reason that they couldn't train or didn't have the discipline to eat in those ways. And I thought, this is not kind of what I got into with a, a love for training the gym. And it's very different coaching as opposed to actually training. So then I thought, can I take this digital marketing knowledge and everything that I've learned and start offering it to, again, small local businesses in Chelmsford, Essex, where I'm based And I just put myself out there, like went to shows, went into shops and just just sort of struck up a conversation. I was asking, have you got a website? And then, yeah, conversation started from there. Like, can you do this little piece? Can you do that bit? Started doing websites for free. And once I'd done two or three, I I started to build my confidence and then start to charge little bits here and there. And it's just over the past year and a bit it's just absolutely skyrocketed to be honest wow. where i've now got two full-time staff working overseas who are amazing and really support me take a lot of the sort of laborative tasks away like the fiddly bit 
bits on web design here and there doing taking this bit of text and add it to here things that mm -hmm. take ages which has allowed me to speed up the process but at the same time understand like i can scale this there's i've got a team now if i take on more work i've got capacity to be able to do those projects yeah and scale it's just scale it up from there so we'll see how it goes over the next six months but it's going in the right direction i love this i stay I, humble I... and keep going yeah, I love that because you talk about just the evolution of how you started. So you said you, you're like, I was studying web design and graphic design and then ended up going to the coffee shop. You were working there and then you were asking all the customers trying to find what's next for you, what what's interesting. And then that's how you found the construction job. You were there for five years. Then you were in psychosis, the hospitalization, quit, and then got into transitioning. What I, what I really think is so interesting you talk about the Amazon FBA and doing the Etsy shop and being like, this isn't for me. I'm not a hamper person. I'm not going to stay in this business, even though I feel like it's going, it's going pretty good. I want to actually feel fulfilled and find something that I enjoy. So then you transition into personal training and then from there coaching, but then feeling like this is kind of like taking on a job that I'm, I'm feeling like I'm using a lot of my time doing this and it's not exactly what I imagined it would be like or how I'd be able to help people in this way. So you went back to what you enjoyed from the beginning, which is graphic design, helping yeah. businesses with that. So I just think it's super inspiring, right? For people listening, um, especially if you're also living with bipolar and you're feeling unfulfilled in where you are, either career-wise or job-wise, or you know, maybe you're feeling like, I feel like a failure right now. I feel hopeless. I've quit different jobs. I've been fired from multiple places. And I know I felt that way. I've been, I've had a lot of jobs where I quit, I get fired. I feel like this sucks. Something's never going to work out. And I really love what Mike is, is sharing is because especially with bipolar disorder and living with that, you want to be able to cultivate an environment and a living for yourself that helps you stay well, even when we're met with times that we're not going to be doing well, well there's going to be things in life that we can't control that happen that are going to resurface. But that's what I really like. And honestly, I mean, me hearing me listening to this, it's inspiring me. And that's why this podcast, I mean, it really brings me so much hope because even on the days when I'm down and I'm overwhelmed and I'm stressed out and I'm struggling and I, I just am not in a good space at all. This, these talks give me so much hope because it gives a face to what does bipolar look like? What is it? Mm. Right. And it's you and it's me and it's everyone coming out here and who's saying, look, I've been diagnosed with this. I was hospitalized. Here's what I'm doing. And also be super real and say, this is what sucks right now, but this is what's working. And this is what I've tried. So I would love to ask you, because I always ask this question to everyone. You never know what you're going to get. But Mike, what does it mean for you when you think about your life right now? What does live well bipolar mean for you? Yes, live well bipolar to me is a complete change of perspective. Before, I didn't actually know what bipolar is. Um, I thought it was mood fluctuations and bits and pieces like that. And when I was first diagnosed, I saw it as... A negative thing i thought oh no like i've got this mental health condition it means that i can't do this can't do that people are going to see me in this way i think the more you learn about it the more you see it as a little bit of a superpower you've got this edge over people it seems like my mind works a little bit on overdrive but if you do the right things you can tame it and use that to your advantage use that for creativity um so i would say it's embracing the bipolar but at the same time it's adjusting your lifestyle because luckily nowadays and since covid there's a lot more remote working me personally it's having the freedom to work wherever and whenever i want and adjusting my career to align with what i truly want and sometimes it could just be wanting to have a nap every day between 11 and two o'clock <laughs> not the whole three hours but sometimes i'll just uh, pretty much every day i'll get a crash after lunch and if i worked in an office i wouldn't be able to just have a nap for about half an hour and then go again but right. i feel like i need that so i yeah i'm lucky enough i can do that every day 
and then just go again i might work i might work at half seven eight at night but it's fine because it's on my terms and yeah so it's adjusting your lifestyle to to make it work for you yeah i love how you talk about changing your perspective and saying this is how i used to view bipolar it was a bad thing it was so much negative it was all of the pain that came with it but then shifting your perspective to what can i do to change my lifestyle and how can i adjust this and how can i embrace the fact that i have been given this diagnosis and really seeing like you said seeing it like a superpower because i know i also am like that as well you know with anything in life that happens to us good or bad I always, I always try as hard as I can to see the lesson in it, to see what, what is this teaching me? What is this trying to teach me? And then how can I use this to my advantage to help myself and to help others? And I think that you lay that out so beautifully in illustrating the way in which your perspective has shifted and the small changes that we can make to create the life that we want. And, you know, in the process of working towards that, you know, it's not going to be a success right away. We're going to have everything we've ever dreamed of. It's awesome all the time, but to still have grace for ourselves in the moments of working towards that process. So I am super thankful for you in this conversation. And I can't wait to share my story with you on your channel and to share this episode. But before we end, can you please tell everyone where they can go to stay connected with you? Yes. So on my YouTube channel would be the best place. Um, through the comments section, my YouTube channel is It's Mike McDonnell, McDonnell spelled M C D O double N E double L. On there, you can also visit my website, which is mikemcdonnell.co.uk, and you'll see on the home page that there's a link to join the waiting list for the book that I'm going to bring out very soon. Yes. Hopefully soon. I am so excited for you. And I'll have all that linked in the show notes. So I will have his YouTube channel and his website and you guys can go on there and check it out. I'm so excited for you with the book that's coming out and also your channel. You guys, I told Mike because it's pretty funny story. He reached out to me and he was wanting to come on the show. And I feel like I get a lot of requests for people wanting to come on the podcast. I get so many requests and I honestly, like sometimes it's overwhelming where I can't always get back to people, but he I, I looked at his channel and I watched his, I was looking at his video and I subscribed. I liked, I like, I love supporting other creators and I responded to him and I'm like, this is super cool. And I would absolutely love to share your story because it's all about making sure that these stories can help you. That's what it's about. Is this podcast is I want to show you people, real people who live with bipolar or do work in the field and really what's, what's working, what's not. And to, to make it something that we can learn from together. So Mike, I just want to thank you again for coming out on the podcast. This conversation was awesome. I cannot wait to share it and, and to continue to work together and to support your journey and really your book and all the things that you're doing and putting out. So thank you for coming out and just sharing what has worked in your journey so far. No, thank you very much. Cheers for having me. That's the first one done. Yeah, Yay. you did it. Your first podcast. See, I mean, achieve something. <laughs> I know. So, so yeah. And you guys too, thank you for being here and always tuning in, whether you're listening for yourself or someone that you love and care for. Thank you so much. It means the world to me because you are making an impact for yourself and those that you care and love for. So I hope that everyone has a good rest of the day or nighttime, and I will see you guys in the next one. All right. Bye guys. Bye Mike. Bye. See ya.